child this morning is that a shout or a wail or a scream let's celebrate glory amen you can be seated with your sweet smart self and grab your notebook your pen and let's get into the word of god this morning <clears throat> so good to be back home um thank you for your prayers everyone who prayed for me while i was out to the u.s last sunday i was in indiana and then i flew to maryland we had a great time in maryland preached for two churches preached for a church and then went to preach for power city maryland it was quite exciting in maryland we had people drive all the way from new jersey people came from new york to maryland we had people come from all parts you know of that part of the united states it was quite exciting to see all of them share fellowship with a number of them and uh, bring their love back to you amen all right it's been a week of great praying and praying and praying i was in all the prayers you know um, um i mean it's it's been exciting all the time we had teaching you on prayer bringing clarity to what prayer is fellowshipping with the father in a bit to understand who the father is and understand the character of the father and i took time to explain to you within the week that pr prayer takes on the character of the father and that the father's character is what is reflected in what we call answers to prayer. You didn't hear that. The father's character is, is what is reflected in what we call answers to prayer. That is God can never answer any prayer outside the confines of his character. His character is what truly reflects answers to prayer. And that is why before you pray it's been answered. Because prayer is not getting God to do something. Prayer is actually declaring the answers that God has already given to you in Christ Jesus. So it's been exciting, you know, all the time we spent praying within the last 10 days or so. Amen. All right, let's get back to the message we've been teaching, um, reflecting the Father, reflecting the Father. The book of Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 reflecting the father matthew 28 18 and jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth next verse go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we've established that Jesus in his teaching ministry right here in Matthew 28 was reading from Genesis to Malachi. Remember, he always taught beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So the textbook that Jesus used in teaching what he was teaching here in Matthew chapter 28 was a textbook of Genesis to Malachi. So when Jesus said all power in heaven and earth is given to me, he was making reference to Moses' heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. All right. So when Jesus talked about heaven and earth, he was making reference to what Moses was communicating about the amalgamation of heaven and earth. The unification of heaven and earth in Christ. That is why the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus was the coming together of heaven and earth. Now, if you observe very carefully, in Luke chapter 24, verse 26, put it up for me, Luke 24, 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded, interpreted unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Look at verse 44 and 45 of the same Luke chapter 24, 44 and 45. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me next verse then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures that they might sune me the scriptures which means to bring everything together 
All right, now, you know, E.W. Kenyon, a theologian I respect so much, says that the Bible is written in the light of our redemption. That the Bible, the entire Bible is written in the light of our redemption. That is, there's a common light, the light of our redemption. It opens up with redemption and closes with redemption. That's how the scriptures, you know, communicate. So all the facts that Jesus used and taught in the four gospels were not innovated. They are from the Old Testament. Now, I said this last, you know, two Sundays ago. If God is not father in the Old Testament, he cannot be father in the four gospels. If God is not father in the Old Testament, he cannot be father in the four gospels. You know, some people have this impression that God was a bad boy in the Old Testament. Then he got born again in the New Testament. So they say that the God of the Old Testament was very destructive. But the God of the New Testament is a good boy. He's a good shepherd. Who lays down his life for the sheep. That will mean that God is inconsistent. And that will mean that God cannot be relied upon. But the good news is God is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He never changes. If he was father in the New Testament. It means he was father in the Old Testament. So there is a consistency to the character and the personality of God. Please stay with me. There is no distinction whatsoever. It is only explanations. So we began to look at the concept of the father and we looked at Abraham and examined Abraham. We saw the sea, we saw the land, we saw the increase in Genesis chapter 1. We saw the sea, the land and the increase in Genesis chapter 1. We also saw the concept of image and son. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. Image and son. We also saw the concept of seed. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 11. The word Zerah. Seed bringing forth after its own kind. We also saw the concept of the spirit. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The concept of the spirit is how God will walk in the earth. How God will walk in the earth. Because God's walk in the earth is by his spirit. That is how he brings the heaven and the earth together. Remember we also saw that that is how God redeems through his son. He redeems as father through the son by the spirit. You didn't hear that. He redeems as father through the son by the spirit. Let me repeat one more time. He redeems as a father through the son by the spirit. That is how God redeems and that is how God works. So he makes a promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Put it up for me. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the promise. And we see that promise reiterated in Genesis 4.25 and Genesis chapter 5 verse 3. We found there to be the promise. Which means that when we read God made male and female and he blessed them and said be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it is a promise of redemption. That is God's promise of redemption. Genesis 1.28 Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Is a promise of redemption because the words used there, subdue, have dominion, replenish, multiply, are words of redemption. It means something has gone wrong and so you want to subdue what has gone wrong. You want to multiply, you want to replenish, and you want to have dominion. That is a redemptive work that is done in the image of God. It's a redemptive work that is done in the image of God. Showing you that God will walk with man. And not just that, but God will become a man. And whatever happens, you will find God 
functioning as the band. The, the Hebrew word for as the sun. You will find God functioning as the sun. And then we took time to establish all of that. So how can we view the fatherhood of God? How can we view the fatherhood of God? Please pay attention. In Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham took his son, he took Isaac, his son. You know, Abraham once suggested that his servant should be the heir. His servant, Eliezer. Eliezer was a trusted hand. It was Eliezer that was sent by Abraham to go and get a wife for Isaac. So he was a trusted hand. And God said, no, Eliezer is not going to be the heir. The heir shall come out of thy bowels. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Put it up for me. Genesis chapter 15, verse 3 and verse 4. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be than air. So yet again, he went into his maid by the name Hagar and had a child called Ishmael. And God said, no, it's not going to be Ishmael. He's a son of prophecy. And then we have Isaac. So that sets the tone for what you are about to read in Genesis chapter 22. It sets the tone for Genesis chapter 22. Now, please pay attention. If you start from Genesis chapter 22, Without the background from Genesis chapter 12, you will lift all that he said out of context. If you just read Genesis 22 without following the background from chapter 12, you will go out of context. Because Genesis chapter 22 verse 2, put it up for me, Genesis 22 verse 2, he now says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Take note of these words in, in, that, in that verse. Take thine, thine only son, whom you love. <laughs> Take thine, thine only son, whom you love. Look at verse 7 of Genesis 22. Genesis 22 verse 7. We are traveling through the fatherhood of God. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. My father. Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? We have seen that through Abraham, through Abraham, who is the father of many nations? Huh? God. All right. Because that is the gospel. The gospel is that God will father the nations through Abraham. Are we in the building? The gospel is that God will father the nations through Abraham. Because brother Paul said God preached the gospel through Abraham. You didn't hear that. God preached the gospel through Abraham. What is the gospel? That God will father the nations. That God will father the nations. That's the gospel. And it was preached. You didn't hear that. It was preached through Abraham. Are we in the building? Now, so God will father the nations. And in this shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So whatever we're going to see will be a demonstration of what God is going to do. So God will walk through Abraham's and through Abraham, he will make known or make visible his eternal plan. Let me repeat this. The concept of giving animal sacrifices did not start with the Bible. The concept of giving animal sacrifices 
did not start with the Bible. It's a wrong impression to think that it started with the Bible. Cultures and religions of the world that have nothing to do with the Bible have that practice entrenched in them. Cultures and religions of the world that are not connected to the Bible have the culture of giving animal sacrifices to deities entrenched in them. So the culture of giving an animal sacrifice or a human sacrifice to a deity did not start with the Bible. It is part of man's culture. Man that had fallen from God or man that had sinned. So on Mount Moriah, what God is going to, to do precisely or what God will do through Abraham is to show us why he, God, is different. God on Mount Moriah is about to demonstrate why he is different. Remember, offering animals didn't come from God. That's something, you know, every historical researcher will tell you. It never came from God. It didn't start from God. It didn't come from the Bible. People that had nothing to do with the Bible offered sacrifice. And that happened in their world. So, on Mount Moriah, Isaac asked a very simple question. Because in the world, you offer an animal sacrifice to a deity. So, Papa, Papa or Daddy or whatever, you said we are going to worship. And culturally, you don't go to a deity to worship without an animal. It's culture. So Isaac expected that we should have an animal because it's cultural that when you are approaching a deity, you come with an animal sacrifice. So, Papa, we are going to worship. Where is the animal? Because we are not prepared. There must be an animal to offer. And remember, God in Abraham wants to show us how he is different. Are you still in the building? God wants to show us how he is different. So, he says, where is the sacrifice? If you say we are going to worship God. We never had the young man speak until now. This is the first time we are hearing Isaac have a conversation with the father. Now remember, Abraham, unlike people, teach about him. They teach about Abraham as a businessman. You know, businessman. So when they say the blessing of Abraham, they are thinking of cattle, wealth you know, businesses. And many churches teach that. Many pastors teach that, you know. Now, but Abraham in the Bible was a prophet. He's not a businessman, even though he was a businessman. But the Bible teaches Abraham as a prophet. The word Nabi, N-A-B-I, Nabi, prophet. In fact, in Genesis chapter 18 verse 1, let's establish that first. Genesis chapter 18 verse number 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. The Lord appeared to Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. The Lord, or the word of the Lord, came to Abraham in a vision. Look up to me, everybody. So, number one, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Number two, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Genesis chapter 20, verse number 7. Now, therefore... Restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. He is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, no doubt that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. For he is a prophet. 
So, what is Abraham? Talk to me, Power City. What is Abraham? What do prophets do? Prophets foresee. Prophets foresee. The word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision. The Lord appeared to Abraham. All right? Prophets foresee. So, the Bible wants you to see Abraham as a prophet, not a businessman. Even though he's a businessman, but that is not the communication of scriptures concerning the character called Abraham. So we're going to find in his actions what he foresaw. Because if the mission of the prophet is to foresee, and Abraham is a prophet, so we're going to find out in his actions what he foresaw. On Mount Moriah, which is where he takes his son, we have established that Isaac is not the seed of Abraham. Have we established that? Isaac is not the seed. In thy seed, in thy seed, so Isaac is not the seed of Abraham. So he takes the seed to demonstrate what he saw as a prophet. Is it what he saw he will do or what he saw God will do? That's what he saw, right? What God will do. Not what he, Abraham, will do. Wait, wait, wait. Is it what Abraham will do that he foresaw or what God will do? And I have a reason why I'm asking. I'm going to ask it again. Is it what he, Abraham, will do that he foresaw or what God will do? So in the actions of Abraham, what will he be communicating? What God will do, not what Abraham will do. Good. Mm -mm. Now, so when Isaac asked that question in verse 8 of Genesis 22, put it up again for me. Genesis 22, verse number 8. Please pay attention. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself. God will provide himself a lamb. The all sufficient one. I am that I am. I will be what I will be. And if he's the almighty, he should be able to become whatever he needs to become at any time, anywhere, for any purpose. The all sufficient one. The double breasted God. I am a the Lord will provide himself. If he's all sufficient, he shouldn't require anything from anybody else. That means whatever he will require or need will come out from his sufficiency. So the Lord will provide himself. Are you still here? He will provide himself. So Abraham said, my son. My son. Father, my son. <laughs> Are you catching it now? He foresaw. So as a prophet, if he foresaw his actions, will he be communicating what Abraham will do or what God will do? So my father, my son. My father. Where is the animal? My son. God will provide himself. <laughs> in the Old Testament, in their culture, they brought animals to deity. But God wants to show you how he's different. So in this case, you wouldn't bring an animal to deity. Deity will be the animal. Oh, glory to God. Deity will be the animal himself. Now, pay attention. Genesis 22, verse 2 again. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. <clears throat> now, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a bond offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell thee of. Then in verse 8. Genesis 22 verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a bond, a lamb for a bond offering. A lamb for a bond offering. 
God will provide himself. Remember, the concept of giving sacrifice to deities didn't come from God. So what's going on here? God is making a distinction. I am not the one asking. I am the one giving. I am not the one demanding. I am the one supplying. He will provide himself alone. The word he saw to see. All right. He now says, the Lord will provide. The word Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. We are going to examine later Jehovah Jireh in verse 14. Now, the word Ra, it shall be seen. Upon the mountain, it shall be seen. So, as a prophet, Abraham foresaw. Let's establish it a bit further. Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse number 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried. And his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Next verse. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Being a prophet. Next verse. Being a prophet. He seen this before. The prophet. Spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption David foresaw and oftentimes when they prophesied they used a first person pronoun in their prophecy all right and you think they are talking to someone else you know? the lord said unto my lord First person pronoun. Sit on my right hand until the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. When he's talking about something he foresaw. Notice he said I will dwell, David said that, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But Peter said his sepulchre is with us. He's dead and gone. But that's the man who said, I will dwell in the house forever. Are we in the building? So when they prophesied, he said, like David, the Lord is at my right side. I shall not be moved. He said, in his presence, there is fullness of joy and his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Peter said, that David who said all these things, his sepulchre is with us. Meaning, he was not talking about himself. He spoke as if he was the one, but he was not talking about him because he foresaw. So in his actions, he will demonstrate what he foresaw as a prophet. Abraham also foresaw. Abraham saw my days. He foresaw. Why? He's a prophet Nabi. Therefore, in his actions, in his actions, he would demonstrate what he foresaw. Are you still in the building? Stay with me. <clears throat> now, take your son, your only son. Who will do that? Is it Abraham or God? That's what God will do. So he explains it by saying, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Genesis twenty two fourteen calls him Jehovah Jireh. That means Jehovah is provision. That means Jehovah is the sacrifice. Jehovah is provision. So Paul will write in Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 8. And the scripture foreseen that God will justify the hidden through faith preached be 
before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed the scriptures foreseeing the seed of the woman is going to be provided by who by God the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. The Lord shall provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Because we establish in Genesis chapter 17 verse 1, I am the almighty God, Shate, which means I will be Yahweh. I am sufficient. So it's sufficient to be the light of the world. He is sufficient to be the seed of Genesis. So Abraham and Isaac are vessels by which the word of the Lord was communicated. They are vessels by which the word of the Lord was communicated. Abraham and Isaac are vessels. So something we have established about the fatherhood of God is that God always provides the sacrifice. God always provides the sacrifice. Now, remember he talks about the throne of David. He shall sit on the throne of David forever. Now, stay with me. Remember, David is that king who knew he was not king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 5, because the promise is God being the king. So Samuel picks out, you know, Saul. I mean, yeah, Samuel picks out Saul for them. And then Samuel tells them, the king you will ask for. He gives them criteria of that king. Moses had told them in Deuteronomy chapter 17, you are not supposed to have a king at all. But the day you decide to have a king, Make sure he is a billionaire. Make sure he has enough money so he does not oppress you. Number two, make sure he doesn't multiply wives. Number three, make sure he doesn't take gold. Make sure he doesn't take your heart back to Egypt. Moses is telling them, you will one day, if you decide to have a king, even though God doesn't want you to have a king, Let's look for the lesser evil. Okay. That's what Moses tells Let's go for the lesser evil. Make sure the king you will have is a billionaire. Number two, make sure, number three, number four, number five. They said, no problem. He said to them, make sure your king is able to teach the law. Then in First Samuel chapter 8, they said, we are tired of you, Samuel. We want a king. Uh -uh. How can the church be relevant in the world? How? We need to be relevant. We need to take over. Kingdom take over. We want to be like other gods, other kingdoms, other nations. We want to be in charge of politics. We want to be in charge of entertainment. We want to be in charge of sports. We want to be in charge of fashion. Kingdom take over. We want to be like other nations. We also want to be relevant. Uh -uh. How can you say we are not of this world? We are in this world. We will mix with them and change them. Uh -uh. <laughs> we don't want to be an irrelevant church. Don't be funny. The word church is a gathering. Gathering. Some people say, well, the new normal is no need for physical gathering. Let's do Zoom service. New normal. <laughs> Let's do Zoom service. After all, in our company, we do Zoom. There's no need to gather physically. Let's do Zoom. How are you different from other nations? Let's be like them. No, the church is called ecclesia, the gathering. Like we're gathered here. That's God's plan for the church. The church ought to be a gathering. 
not online. Okay? Not watching from afar. The church is not the browsing. The church is the gathering. Somebody say, I hear you. Yeah. One of the things we will defend in our generation is the sanctity of the scriptures and our physical gathering as a church. So when they said, we want to be like other nations, Saul dealt with them, dealt with them severely. He got to a point in 1 Samuel 15, so Samuel was afraid of the man that he ordained. <laughs> Samuel was afraid. God said, Samuel, go and do this. Day. The man will kill me. Yet it was Samuel who ordained him. <laughs> he said, he will kill me. God said, okay. Don't say you're going to anoint somebody. Say you're going to offer sacrifice. <laughs> say you're going to worship. <laughs> it's called wisdom. Say you're going to worship. He said, where are you going? I'm going to worship God. Meanwhile, he's going to anoint a new king. Well, the anointing of a new king is worship. Is it not worship? It's worship. It's just uh, it's semantics. It's worship. Is it not worship? It's service. <laughs> God said, I thought God has a good sense of humor. Uh, he will kill you. Eh? Okay, don't tell him you're anointing somebody. Just say, I'm going to worship. That will suffice. So, where are you going? I'm going to worship God. He poured the oil. He has finished worship. <laughs> Glory to God. God was not the one who initiated the process. The process of them having a king was not initiated by God. They were the ones who wanted a king. But God, in his loving kindness, got involved. He didn't hear that. He didn't initiate the process, but in his loving kindness, got involved to rescue them out of the predicament where they put themselves in because he's a loving father. Can't you see that's how God has always been? He tells man, don't do this. If you do, you will die. Man does and die. God dies and saves man. That's how he's always been. He's always been his character. So God gets involved in rescuing them out of the hand of Saul. He became the one who got the brunt of it. In 1 Samuel 16, when he was going to the house of Jesse, God said, I have found a man. 1 Samuel chapter 8, God didn't initiate it. But in 1 Samuel 16, God initiated that one. I have found a man. Saul's re request by Israel was not God. But David being planted over Israel was God. I have found a man after my heart. Samuel said, if Saul should know, he will kill me. Now, David stood up and prophesied. The Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make. Now remember, David prophesied the king. And the king he was prophesying about was not himself. He was talking about the king of glory who is God Almighty. And that was the man after God's purpose and God's plan. David. He is a man that stuck to the promise that God made to Abraham. David stuck to it. That's why Jesus sits on the throne of David forever. Because David stuck to the promise that God made to Abraham. He said, after you I will raise up your seed to sit on the throne. And the seed was not Solomon. The seed of David was not Solomon. Jesus is the seed of David. Now, can you see something? The seed of Abraham is not Isaac. The seed of David is not Solomon. I'm teaching good. That was why one of the names of the Messiah is Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The son of David will be the one when he gets on the throne, he will reign forever. So this is the promise here. So when Jesus uses the phrase heavenly father, you see how it came about? The father of many nations. Heavenly father is the father in the promise God made to Abraham. 
I will make thee a father of many nations. That was God introducing his fatherhood over the nations of the earth using the prophet Abraham. God had to use a language of communication that man will understand. The fatherhood of God. Praise God. Your heavenly father. That means Jesus is simply telling them that that promise that God made to Abraham when he said pray after this manner our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name our father in heaven what Jesus is saying the promise that God made to Abraham is going to be fulfilled now your kingdom come your will be done on earth that promise by using heavenly father and saying thy kingdom come, it, almost, it also means the son is here. Thy kingdom come, the son is here. Because Jesus is the embodiment of the kingdom. Thy kingdom. So the name given to Abraham therefore represents the promise. Look at John 10, 28. Mm -mm, stay with me. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man, actually the original, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Why will you say eternal life? The word he knew on the way. Now and always. Now and always. Eternal life. Now and always. And that was the promise made to Abraham. The seed will inherit the promise forever. Eternal life. The promise made to Abraham. The promise of eternal life in Christ. That's why the word eternal life never meant when you die. Eternal I want to live eternal life. God save my soul. Get born again, my friend. <laughs> Get born again. <laughs> I want to live eternal life. <laughs> if you are not living eternal life, get born again. It is not I want to. It is what you can have now. Glory to God. How many of you have eternal life? Say, I have eternal life right now. It's not, I want to live eternal life. God save my soul. I want to live eternal life. God save my soul. Eternal. Can you see the contradiction? And people sing such songs with joy. What a contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> eternal life means a continuous existence in the earth a continuous existence in the earth eternal life when the Jews use the word eternal life it means the life of the age to come the life of the son of the Messiah eternal life means the life of that son of David who will reign forever so Jesus said, I will give you eternal life. Look at that John 10, 29. John chapter 10 verse 29. My father which gave them me is greater than all. Oh, glory to God. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. No man. Eternal life. No man is able to take them out of my father's hands. Give me the amplified of John 28, John 10, 28 and 29. The amplified version of John 10, 28 and 29. Amplified. And I give them eternal life and they shall never lose it. Can a believer lose salvation? They shall never lose it. Dr. Damina, you said a believer cannot lose salvation. No, I didn't say John 10, 28. They shall never lose it. <laughs> they shall never lose it. Or perish throughout 
the ages to all eternity they shall never by any means be destroyed and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand I, I thought somebody is hearing the sound of my voice this morning somebody say I can never lose salvation say even if I mistakenly keep it somewhere <laughs> it will follow me <laughs> If, if people are not corrupt why are you thinking of losing in the first place <laughs> why, why are you thinking of losing <laughs> corrupt minds <laughs> twisted mentality why think of losing <laughs> you should think of gaining <laughs> why think of losing can I lose salvation yes <laughs> Your own, you will lose. His own, you never lose it. Oh, glory to God. G give me the next verse. Amplified. <laughs> My father, who has given them to me, is greater and mightier than all else. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Glory to God. Why? I and my father are one. He's referring to that promise. When he said, I and my father are one, is the word echoed in the Hebrew in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Deuteronomy, dethrone your enemies. <laughs> Back in the days, dethrone your enemies. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Dr. Damina, how many gods do we have? One. <laughs> what about Trinity? One. <laughs> Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is how many? One. But what about Father, Son, Holy Ghost? One. He's the double breasted God, He's the all sufficient one. And if he's almighty, he can be anything he wants to be. So when he becomes son, he is still the father. When he becomes Holy Ghost, he's still the person. It's just that in his sufficiency, he can be whatever he wants to be for whatever purpose and for how long he desires to be it. Did he collect from you? He didn't collect anything from you. It is out of him that the father came. It is out of him that the son came. It is out of him that the Holy Ghost came. And all of them are still part of him. And he can decide to make them non-exist and be alone like that. He's all sufficient one. He's all sufficient one. He became all of that for the purpose of redemption. For the purpose of redemption. If there was no fall of man, there would be no Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Father, Son, Holy Ghost was to save man. That's a demonstration of God's love. He became Son because only Son can die. He became Holy Ghost because Holy Spirit can live in man. If I'm teaching, shout I hear you. The Lord your God, Moses already told them it's one God. So in Genesis 1.26 when he says, let us make man. Somebody said, but God said, let us. He was talking to other people. Uh -uh. In ancient or in an ancient Near Eastern language, when you say let us, it is used for a council of gods. A council of gods. When they talk differently in one. So again, God uses human language. Let us. When they talk differently in one. Okay? Differently in one. So God is using human language to talk about his work in redemption. Let us make man. It is still God talking to himself. Genesis 1.26 That is God's redemptive project. Let us make man in our image. That is God's redemptive project. God wants to make a man that has his image. Teaching good this morning. Which means it's going to be father through son and by his spirit. Father through son and by his spirit. So God's promise is to be a father. God has always been a father. He is a father in the promise. 
He gave and in the covenant he made to Abraham. Look at Isaiah 63 verse 16. Mm -mm, pay attention. Isaiah 63 16. Doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us. And Israel acknowledge us not. Thou O Lord art our father. Our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. You are our father. Even though Israel and Moses don't know us. You are our father. This goes beyond Israel and the fatherhood of Abraham over them. This is talking about the father of nations. I'm teaching here. Hosea 11 verse 1. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. Hosea. When Israel was a child. Then I loved him. And called my son out of Egypt. I called my son out of Egypt. All those phrases shows you that that is God's promise. That is God's will. He wanted to be a father to Israel. Deuteronomy 131. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 31. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bore thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. So the imagery of a father and a son. Look at Exodus 4.22. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22. And thou shalt say, and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God intends to do this by his spirit. So when you read Isaiah 52, 54, for example, and God is called a husband. Isaiah 54 verse 5. God is a husband. Then Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 8 to 14. The description of God in the covenant is God is a husband. Even though he has an everlasting adulterous woman. Everlasting adulterous woman. He still remains her husband. Hosea demonstrated it. Married a, prost married a wife. She went to prostitution. He went to the prostitution house. Married her again. She went again back to prostitution. This time around, she went into the kind of prostitution where to get her back, you have to pay. He went and paid and brought her back. In the prophecy of, Isaiah, of Hosea, demonstrating God's everlasting love for, for an adulterous wife the church that's why he's a husband that's why the bible uses those phrases for him are we in the building God couldn't keep his marriage with Israel because Israel was always departing. He will bring her back, she will depart. He will bring her back, she will depart. He never got tired of bringing her back. That's his nature. Jeremiah 31, 32. If you have a good Bible, Jeremiah 31, 32. Put it up for me. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. With my covenant, they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. They broke the covenant even though I was their husband. The new covenant is also called a marriage. The new covenant is a marriage. You can read when you get home Ezekiel 16, 59 to 60. Ezekiel 15, 16, 59 to 60. Hosea chapter 2 verse 7. Joel chapter 1 verse 8. Hosea 2, 7, Joel 1, 8. 
Isaiah 62 verse 5. Put it up for me. Isaiah 62 verse number 5. For as a young man married a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So God therefore is a father. He is a husband in this new creation. All these things describe who he is and what he does. So in Exodus chapter 20, where we read the Ten Commandments, which is actually the word of God. Exodus 20 verse 5. Exodus chapter 20 verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them. Now remember... Exodus 20 verse 1 to 11 is about faith and worship. Faith and worship of God. Exodus 20 verse 1 to 11. Believe in God. Have no other God beside him. Faith in God. So Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 to 7, faith. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 to 11, rest. Saboath, Sabbath. And you know, some people think when we say rest in Christ, it means cool down, do nothing. <laughs> say rest in Christ. Then just say, okay, cool down, do nothing. No. To rest in him means operate from rest. Stay in rest and from rest function. So if we enter into his rest, he now begins to function through, through us. Rest was a language used for work. What is the work of God today? Honor. Just honor him. Thou shall not. Verse 13 to 17 of Exodus 20. Thou shall not, thou shall not. Why is he saying this? Because he is introducing a counterculture. A counter narrative or a counter lifestyle. We don't go among to adapt. Mm -mm. We go against to take over. The church does not adapt. The church takes over. Because the church is counterculture. We don't do it so that we can be accepted. We do it because it's right. And in doing that, we change their mind. We don't get among them and try to be accepted by them. No, we get among them and establish who we are. And then who we are challenges their mind. And before you know it, they adapt to who we are. In Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44, put it up for me, Leviticus 11 44. Glory to God. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves. And you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves in any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Which means that in God's redemption, he doesn't covet. He honors. He loves. Let me mention the concept of love. Ahiv in the Hebrew. Love means to esteem. The other person above yourself. Which was strange to humanity. To esteem the other person above yourself was very strange. It was counterculture. But that was God. To esteem. When you say you love, in God's language, you are esteeming the other person above yourself. Then God introduced it in the law of Moses. Why? Because God is changing how we think. God is changing how we think. In Leviticus 19, 18, he says to love your neighbor as yourself. It simply means to esteem the other person. Who are you supposed to love? Strangers, widows. No child sacrifice. These were the things Moses said within their world. You know? 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, do me, I'll do you. Scratch my back, I scratch yours. Hit my leg, I hit yours. An eye for eye. You touch my leg, I touch your own three times. That was Moses' law. And God said, no. I changed the narrative. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who persecute you. That's counterculture. That's not the lifestyle of the world. That's not how people live. If you live like that, people call you a fool. But that's God. Moses says it. Then Jesus said, no, but that's not the heavenly father. This is how the heavenly father functions. Do this that you may be the children of your father who makes the sun to shine on the good and on the bad. Hello? Are you in the house? Our heavenly father is forgiving. Our heavenly father is redemptive. Our heavenly father rescues slaves and treats them well. When Jesus mentions the word heavenly father, he's referring to the founder of love. The founder of forgiveness. The one that initiated reconciliation as we see in Genesis. He is father because everything that is good started with him. Hallelujah. Everything that is good started with him. So when God is called father, it's not father in labor room. He's not father in the maternity world. He is father in his promise of redemption. He is father in his promise of reconciliation. He is father in his forgiveness. So in what we call the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, your mind goes back to the promise of redemption, the promise of forgiveness, and the promise of the forgiveness of your sins. Where he covers man's shame. Not just that, but we see him throughout the ages accommodate and tolerate in order to walk through and walk with God's will. That's why he's father. He tolerates, he accommodates, he covers because he is father. Am I teaching good? How many of you fathers here want to disgrace your children? When your children do wrong, you say, everybody gather, neighbors, gather. This boy is a stupid boy. Can you imagine what happened? I send him to go and buy something and bring change. He used the whole money. Very stupid boy. No parent does that. A father will cover, a father will protect, a father will forgive, a father will tolerate. That's why he's called father. God is called father because he tolerates. God is called father because he forgives. God is called father because he covers and protects. God is called father because he defends. That's why he's father. He forgives, he loves. That's why he's father. He has the capacity to take it in, absorb it, and forgive. That's why he's called father. It's not because he went to the labor ward to deliver children. Because of his love and mercy. For the people he created. Who have been adopted into his family. By Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So Jesus says your kingdom come. And that's the kingdom we have been talking about. Your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. Which is what we are doing today. Establishing his will all over the earth. Bringing men into salvation. Bringing men into the knowledge of God. So how is his will done on earth? His will is done on earth by his spirit. Which we received in the new birth. So God is father because he is the example. He is father because he is the, he is the inaugurator. He is father because he is the founder. He is the founder of all that he tells us to do. When he tells you to forgive, it's because he forgives. When he tells you to love, it's because he loves. When he tells you to tolerate, it's because he himself tolerates. God is father because he is the example. Hallelujah. He can't ask you to do what he doesn't do. God therefore in his humanity he's called son. God in his humanity is called son. And then in the resurrection he walks by his spirit. 
In humanity, he's called son. In his resurrection, he walks by his spirit. Three personalities, one single person. And we see that walk throughout the scriptures. Three of them, yet one. One walking in three, making sure that man gets help. <laughs> one walking in three, making sure that man gets help. You didn't hear that. I want to repeat it. One, walking in three, making sure that man gets help. He calls himself the Ezar, help meets. Ezar the God. One who rescues us from trouble. So Jesus said, be like that your father. One who rescues us out of trouble. One who forgives. One who delivers from the wicked and the evil one. And when he's saying that, he's reading Genesis to them. Hallelujah. In the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he commences the new creation by his spirit. It means when he goes to the cross, God's son sacrificed for us in the culture of Abraham. It is God that takes the animal sacrifice. But now he becomes our sacrifice. He doesn't ask us to bring animal. He becomes our animal. He doesn't ask us to offer. He offers to us. He doesn't demand from us. He supplies us. He doesn't take from us. He gives to us. That's the father. Hallelujah. That's our father. He doesn't stop at him being the sacrifice. He says, I will multiply this upon the face of the earth. How are you going to multiply something? How are you going to work with everybody? It will be by the spirit. Ruach in the Hebrew. Like a wind. A wind. That is what you have in all the earth. A wind of God. The breath. And it's in everyone that has risen from the dead. He's in everyone. And those that are here to rise. He is hovering around them. He is hovering around them. And the moment they open up, he raises them from the dead. And as he raises them from the dead, he occupies them. He lives in them. He walks in them. He becomes their father. They become his sons and daughters. All over the world. All over the world. The spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. And God said, light be, light was. Moving all over the world. Hey, glory to God. And that prophecy is being fulfilled today. All over the world. The spirit of God is moving. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is flooding the nations as the water covers the sea. And it's happening in our time. I say it's happening in our time. Somebody's not shouting hallelujah. Somebody's not shouting hallelujah. You may not see it. You may not see it. But it's happening all over the place. God will walk by his spirit and he's going to walk in us. So when he says your will be done on earth, he's talking about your spirit will begin to walk in us to fulfill his kingdom. So God's spirit is walking in us, through us, to establish the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. Hallelujah. And he does it through believers. He does not, he does not, he does not hold back. He gives everything he has. That's why he's your father. He forgives. He reconciles. He restores. He loves. And that promise of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, 2, and 3 is being fulfilled today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form, void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. Waters is human beings. And God said. And today by the move of the spirit. God is saying. Every time you go to evangelize. God is saying. Because the spirit is moving. And when you speak the word. The spirit convicts. A man is born again. He's raised to, to, to life. And the spirit of God fills him up. He too goes out. And he speaks the word. Because the spirit is moving. And men are brought back to life. And through that, God is multiplying his family all over the face of the earth. 
If somebody is understanding what I'm teaching this morning, shout a powerful amen. Get on your feet, shout glory. Bless this morning all over the world. From nation to nation, from coast to coast, from the mountain to the valley, all over the face of the earth. There is a move of God all over the nations of the earth. Lift, lift your right hand and say with me, I am God's vessel. Shout it very loud. Let the devil hear you very well. Say, I am God's instrument through which the spirit of God reaches the nations of the earth. Say, I'm a witness of the gospel. I'm a witness of the message. Through me, God is saying, light be, light is. Men that sit in darkness are receiving light because I gave my mouth to be used by God. Light be. Light is. So when you go for evangelism, what are you saying? Light be. Let there be light. Let there be light. Blessed to be a blessing until all the families of the earth be blessed. That's the commission. That's the mandate. That's the message. That's what we preach. And that's what we make known to all of humanity all over the face of the earth. Our God reigns. And he reigns forever. Hallelujah. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, we rejoice this morning. And we thank you for the privilege of learning and growing. And being established and grounded in the knowledge of Christ. Revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge. Like never before. The floodgates of your spirit all over our being. As we go forth preaching, making known Christ, proclaiming the gospel, demonstrating the kingdom, unveiling the depths of God and bringing men to the fullness of Christ. And I speak this morning that everyone hearing the sound of my voice, whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Barriers are terminated. Obstacles taken away. In the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed. Be healed. Be healed. In the name of Jesus. And I declare the glorious light of the gospel shines in the, in the hearts of men all over the earth. Thank you for great men and women you are raising out of this house that will preach this gospel like never before. And we give you praise. Your word confirmed with signs, wonders and miracles. And we rejoice that all over the world, the revelation of Jesus floods the earth as the water covers the sea. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Go ahead and celebrate the word of God this morning. Is that celebration or is that some... Glory! Amen! Yeah, 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 yeah. When you see darkness, what does God say? Light be. Light be. Where there's sickness, what do you say? Health be. Where there's lack, what do you say? Provision, supply be. You call the things that be not. That's the way our father functions. Reflecting the father. You go to where there's chaos, you command order. Order! Be! Go to where there's confusion. Direction! Be! You go to where there's bondage. Freedom! Be! The gospel is counterculture. If sickness was the norm, you change it. You don't say, well, uh, you say it's been like that from your great-grandfathers. Anyway, we just manage it. May the Lord comfort you. No, we counter that culture. It can't exist any further. Health be. Zabodagaya. If I'm teaching this morning, shout a good amen. amen. So whatever did not look like what Christ has done that is making noise around you today, right now, Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice all over this building. Online, on television, wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice. I command that culture cancelled. I release the culture of heaven. In the name of Jesus, light be. In the name of Jesus, receive direction. Receive direction. Receive order. 
in the name of Jesus. And that's what you take to the nations of the earth. You go against culture and you declare God's mind. Praise God. Amen. I'll be rounding up reflecting the Father in the second service. And we're going to deal with some things. I'm excited already about it. Amen. You don't want to miss it. You want to be a part of the second service on radio, on TV, online. It's going to be exciting. Soteria season 8. Soteria season 8 begins next Sunday. Are you excited about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that, it's about that season, man. Soteria season 8 is going to be the emphasis of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Kabayada, 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 kabayada. It's going to be exciting. You don't want to miss it from next Sunday. We begin Soteria season 8. And I'm going to be teaching every day from next Sunday till the end of the month. And then on the 31st will be the end of Soteria season 8. We begin homecoming from the 1st. Homecoming from the 1st to the 8th of August. We have everybody coming from all over the world. Our online family, we will get to meet some of them face to face. And all of the campuses all over the world. And everybody who follows this ministry around the world. It's going to be exciting. And then from the 1st of July. I mean, yeah, 1st of July, which is this Thursday. Is a Power Bible School. From this Thursday. Power Bible School. All right, so all the students are arriving from the 31st. You know, to make sure they're here on the 1st. And from the first, we'll begin the Power Bible School. If you're here to get your form, you better go grab your form quickly. It's going to be it's gonna be a Bible school like we've never had before. It's going to be an exciting time. We're in classroom every day from morning till night. From morning till night. You know, <laughs> I was teaching in America and I said to them, can you imagine? Jesus took unbelievers. 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 For Bible study. Three days unbelievers. They are not yet born again. They are not yet born again. They have not become disciples. These are unbelievers. He took them for Bible study. Three days. Three days. Bible says after the third day, he now said, let them go. The disciples said, send them away. He said, no, they will faint on the road because they've been sitting down for three days for Bible study. Unbelievers. No wonder believers is 40 days. <laughs> Believers is 40 days. That's the way Jesus taught. And that's the way we're supposed to teach. That's the way we're supposed to teach. I'm not joking. I'm serious. That's what we're supposed to teach. That's why a man like Brother Paul will teach from morning till evening. Then from evening till midnight, Eutychus falls down, die, they raise the dead, they put him on a chair, they continue till morning. Intensity. That's the way to understand doctrine. The kind of things we're teaching, that's the kind of intensity it requires. You, you can't be casual about it. You must be intentional about understanding the, the word of God. It, it, that's the only way to understand it. Otherwise, it will keep sounding like, like, a, like, like a mystery. The way to crack it open is to give it that concentration, that dedication to learning. And that's what we're going to be doing from next Sunday till the end of July. It's going to be very exciting. Are you excited about it? So.